In this video, we're going to see how formal charge applies in an organic structural context, looking at formal charges at carbon, as well as important heteroatoms, oxygen and nitrogen most notably. And we're going to see how to represent organic structures in three dimensions, using wedges and dashes to show bonds that are coming out of the screener page and going back into the screener page. But let's start with formal charges. One thing to note is that formal charges are never left out of bond line structures. Formal charges can't be left out because they influence and affect and determine the number of valence electrons in the molecule. And that is a very, very important number, the number of electrons we're working with. So we can't just leave those out, otherwise we'll get the wrong idea about the number of valence electrons in the molecule. On this slide, we're going to focus on positively and negatively charged carbons. Positively charged carbons are known as carbocations, and negatively charged carbons as carb anions for fairly obvious reasons. And one interesting observation about these species is that they bear three bonds rather than four, and we can do a formal charge analysis to see this, and I want to do this on this slide just to get really familiar with carbocations and carb anions. So let's start with the carbocation. We know that neutral carbon has four valence electrons. We know this from the periodic table. This means a cationic carbon within a molecule must have three valence electrons, formally speaking, right? If we split each bond homolytically with one electron going to each atom involved in the bond, the co positively charged carbon ends up with three electrons total. And if we think about this structure that we're looking at here with this carbon, with three bonds drawn explicitly with positive formal charge, it already has three electrons, one electron each from the three sigma bonds to it, right? And so it lacks an implied hydrogen at the positively charged carbon, and there are three and only three bonds at that positively charged carbon. So two important um, things to take away here. The first is this carbon is violating the octet rule in a deficiency sense. It's only got six total electrons rather than eight, and there are no implied hydrogens at that cationic center. In the carbanion, well again, neutral carbon has four valence electrons. The carbon that is anionic in the structure must thus have five, and we've accounted for three in the three single bonds. So there must be an implied lone pair here, which we can omit because we know this carbon is going to satisfy the octet rule and have a formal charge of, of negative one. So it's got to have that lone pair. And with that lone pair there, we can count five formal or valence electrons here. And so the carbon is formally negatively charged. So the thing to notice about the carb anion is there is an implied lone pair there. And like the carbocation, there's no implied hydrogen at that anionic center. It's actually satisfying the octet rule with only three bonds and a lone pair rather than four bonds. This slide is really just a formal exposition of the idea of formal charge and gives a three-step process for determining the formal charge of an atom within a structure. We start by determining the appropriate number of valence electrons for the neutral atom, and this comes from the group number on the periodic table, right? Four for carbon, five for nitrogen, six for oxygen, seven for fluorine, etc. We then determine the implied number of valence electrons from the atom in the structure, and we do this by imagining splitting each bond in half and giving one electron from each bond to each atom involved in the bond. And so this turns out to be the number of bonding pairs, or BP, plus two times the number of lone pairs at the atom, since lone pairs are owned by the atom itself, and so both electrons in a non-bonding lone pair go to the atom itself. We then take that number of electrons, valence electrons in the neutral atom, we subtract the number of electrons implied by the structure, and that is the formal charge. Now, quite often in organic chemistry, we won't do this math. Formal charges will, will just be given or will have kind of a, a familiar sort of bonding pattern in front of us or some sort of electronic change that helps us imply what the formal charges are will often go the direction of, I know what the formal charge is, but I'm not sure how many lone pairs, for example, are at a given atom in a structure where the lone pairs have been omitted. If we know the formal charge, we can infer the number of electrons, number of valence electrons at the atom implied by the structure, this instruct value, and we can add lone pairs to achieve that value. So let's consider this molecule here, for example. We've got an O minus there. Oxygen, when neutral, has six valence electrons. The negative charge in this structure implies that 
there are seven valence electrons formally associated with that oxygen atom. This includes one of the electrons in the CO single bond and lone pair electrons that are missing. So what we can do now is say, okay, I need seven valence electrons around that oxygen atom and I've accounted for one. I need six more valence electrons and I can add those by adding lone pairs around the oxygen atom. Three lone pairs. Now I've got seven valence electrons associated with that oxygen within the structure minus one that we've accounted for dividing by two gives me the number of lone pairs, which is three. This is just math for what we figured out sort of qualitatively in our heads, um, working through the numbers of uh, electrons here. So this kind of math allows us to draw in implied lone pairs. Now again, you want to do this math less and less and less as you advance through your studies of organic chemistry. And to do that, we're gonna build familiarity with common bonding patterns at carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and the halogens in particular, so that this kind of lone pair accounting becomes second nature. For example, this is very common for anionic oxygen to have three non-bonding lone pairs and a single bond. This is almost always what you'll see negatively charged oxygen doing in um, ionic compounds where O- shows up. And so you'll see these patterns in formal charge and bonding recur over and over and over again and won't have to do this kind of lone pair and formal charge accounting as you move forward. This table outlines some of the common formal charges and bonding patterns at oxygen. And I just want to point out a few things. One thing to notice is that when oxygen is neutral, it almost always has two lone pairs and two bonds. Two lone pairs and two single bonds, for example, or two lone pairs and a double bond are the most common bonding patterns for oxygen when neutral. When negatively charged, one of those bonds gets replaced with a lone pair. So we end up with three lone pairs and one single bond in anionic oxygen. And in cationic oxygen, one of the lone pairs gets replaced with a bond. And so we end up with one lone pair and three bonds. And this can be three single bonds, it can be a double bond and a single bond. Both of these are observed for cationic or positively charged oxygen. For nitrogen, well, now we have one fewer valence electron, so the patterns are a little bit different. Nitrogen, when neutral, typically has one lone pair and three bonds. This could be three single bonds or a double and a single. When anionic, one of those bonds gets replaced with a lone pair, right? And so we go from three bonds and one lone pair to two bonds and two lone pairs in anionic nitrogen. And this could be a double bond or two single bonds. Cationic uh, uh, nitrogen, the lone pair is replaced by a fourth bond. So we end up with four bonds and no lone pairs in cationic nitrogen. And that may be four single bonds like this. It may be a double bond and two single bonds like this. This is not super common, but it can be nitrogen with two double bonds like this. That's formally positively charged nitrogen. Or it can be a triple bond and a single bond. So four bonds, no lone pairs, is typical of cationic nitrogen. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about representing organic compounds in three dimensions. Because the tetrahedral geometry is necessarily three-dimensional, we frequently need to include three-dimensional information in organic structures. And we most often do this using what are called wedges and dashes, or solid wedges and dashed wedges, you'll sometimes hear. What I call wedges are these solid bonds like this, and they represent bonds pointed toward the viewer with the thicker end closer to you and the thinner end farther away. So this thinner end is generally assumed to be in the plane of the screen, and the thicker end is pointed out towards you. Dashes are bonds that are pointed away from you. So the thinner end is again assumed sort of in the plane of the screen, and the thicker end is back behind the screen, farther away from you. So these are wedges and dashes, and we use them to represent tetrahedral carbon in three dimensions. Now, one sort of goofy thing that actually turns out to be rather important is that wedges and dashes at a common atom need to be drawn next to each other. They can't be bisected by in-plane bonds. And this is especially important when you're adding implied CH bonds 
to a tetrahedral center on wedges or dashes. So let me show you what's not okay. What's not okay is to draw a dash on the other side from a wedge. If we look at the in-plane bonds and imagine drawing the in-plane bonds sort of like this, straight up and down, the wedge and dash are on opposite sides of those in-plane bonds. And this actually, if you think about it, if you pause and actually meditate on this for a little bit, you'll realize this is actually a representation of the square planar geometry, not the tetrahedral geometry. So you want to avoid this, but the good news is there are a multitude of valid ways to represent tetrahedral carbon. So all of the structures you see here are all equivalent representations of tetramethyl methane, if you like, four methyl groups attached to a central uh, tetrahedral carbon. And they're, they're all equivalent, they're just different ways of viewing the same structure. So we could, you know, turn this on its side to make this structure. Um, it's, it's completely fine to switch the positions of the wedged and, and dash groups here, like drawing the wedge over here and the dash over here is completely fine. This is sort of like the conformational idea that we touched on earlier, where there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and these are all valid representations. When we discuss stereochemistry a bit later in the course, we'll start to see inequivalent structures in three dimensions and dig into what really makes two structures the same or not the same. But for our purposes now, the main thing you want to focus on is making sure that you draw the wedges and dashes like this. There's a nice little heart to remind you that these should be drawn like this, adjacent to each other, not bisecting the end plane bonds like this, and that's going to be a faithful representation of tetrahedral carbon in three dimensions. It's quite common for wedges and dashes to appear in polycyclic and cyclic compounds, as well as what we call chiral or handed compounds. And one point I wanted to make with these structures is that implied hydrogens may need three-dimensional information when you add them in. And here it's important to properly visualize and think through that tetrahedral geometry. For example, in this acyclic structure, we're going to add implied hydrogens, for example, on a dash right next to that wedged chlorine, creating the heart, if you will. We're going to do the same with the other implied hydrogen at that other carbon bearing a chlorine, putting it on a wedge because we've already got a dash group there adjacent to the chlorine. And whether it's here or on the other side of the chlorine over here is irrelevant. Either orientation is the same molecule, just viewed from slightly different perspectives. Similar thing going on with this molecule in the center with we want to put those H's adjacent to the given wedge or dash when we draw them in. And for this bicyclic compound, one thing I wanted to point out is that these hydrogens at the, the so-called bridge heads, as we'll call them later, these, these carbons where different chains, different tethers across the rings are, are coming together, are generally not drawn with dashes. We want to avoid that because that would be a dash. If you imagine if there was a dash there that's bisecting the in-plane bonds. You want to avoid that. So the main message here is it may be important to think about implied hydrogens in three dimensions, and here really deeply understanding the tetrahedral geometry in three dimensions and the wedge dash convention is really important. We'll use other conventions for representing molecules in three dimensions later in the course and in organic chemistry too, and three of them are shown for you here, Fisher projections, Hayworth projections, and chair structures. I won't go into the details of these for the time being. You'll notice that they, they tend to use, for example, bolding and things to try to show three-dimensional information. The Fisher projection is, is a little bit off the wall. It's the oldest of all of these conventions, and it has survived the test of time in carbohydrate chemistry, so you'll see it, you'll see it there. But the Hayworth and chair projections have some kind of three-dimensional information uh, built in. And we'll tackle the details of these when we get to them later in your studies of organic chemistry.